5 of our lecture about wind turbines, and I was, I was reviewing what we've seen so far, it occurred to me that I forgot to come back to a topic I had meant to come back to way back in like the second part of this lecture, and that is about the so-called augmented horizontal axis wind turbines. And by augmented, we mean that they have some kind of funnel or shroud or something like that mounted on the top of the turbine as well. Uh, sometimes you hear these referred to as uh, diffuser augmented wind turbines. Sometimes you hear these referred to as shrouded wind turbines. It's all terms for slightly different variations on the same technology. But it's this basic idea that you want to have the housing of, you know, the plane of the rotor have faster winds by having kind of funneled winds from a larger cross section into the plane of the wind turbine. And so, you know, you can picture something like a funnel like this where you are ca capturing wind upwind and directing it through a, to a smaller cross section to increase its speed by the gap wind equation that we learned about way back a couple modules in this course. And so, you know, you can kind of picture how this would work is that you'd have the uh, diffuser or the, the shroud or whatever with a slightly larger radius. We're not going to go nuts. It's not like a kitchen funnel where the difference between the radius on the front end and the back end is enormous. But you capture a larger radius of the of a um, larger cross section of the wind and redirect it through a funnel, hopefully speeding it up enough to then increase the speed of the rotor on the inside. And I really wanted to come back to this and spend some time on it because it's a problematic idea. Um, this is actually a difficult thing to engineer. I mean, uh, you know, if you just take this funnel right now, this kitchen funnel, and you kind of swing it through like this, there's flow going in. Well, it isn't like the flow is jetting out the backside of this funnel here. I mean, the truth of the matter is the aerodynamics of the gap wind equation work really well on like a huge scale, like, you know, air passing through a valley, like in the case of Tawantepeckers that we learned about earlier this semester. Or it works really well for like un incompressible flow, like in a hose or something like that. But there's a lot of complications about the aerodynamics of doing it on like the scale of a wind turbine. And so you don't necessarily get that much increase in the speed of the flow, if any, by having a shroud in front of it. There's also the issue of the shroud itself is creating a greater obstacle to the flow. And so overall, you have slowed down the flow in the vicinity of the turbine. So you're going to have to overcome that effect. You know, your, your benefits of having the shroud need to overcome the detriments of having the shroud. Plus, what are you going to make this thing of that is going to be able to be the size of a wind turbine? Now, the shrouded wind turbines that you occasionally see in the literature and so on are all demonstration technologies. There's no, no real operational large-scale uh, deployment of these things as of yet. So they're relatively small turbines. I mean, now picture, you know, a commercial hot that is producing, you know, large amounts of electricity for to enter the grid. How big would the shroud have to be? I mean, are you going to really build a shroud that's, you know, think about that wind turbine that we saw the picture of earlier in this uh, lecture where, you know, the each rotor was the size of an Airbus 380. How, what are you going to build this thing out of that would actually be able to withstand, be up on that tower, able to pivot on the tower, uh, the whole uh, mechanism, the yaw mechanism, gets a whole lot more complicated as to how to turn it. How is this thing going to deal with any rapidly changing winds, like in a storm or something? Um, this is not really a technology that is, is likely to be a part of the story of wind power anytime soon, at least not on any kind of large scale. Maybe like individual like homeowners having wind power because they want to be more off the grid or something like that. Um, you could find some scales in which this technology works, um, but certainly not for like an unmanned, um, you know, wind farm where it's going to just have to be able to operate uh, independently. It's not going to be deployed anytime soon. It doesn't help, too, that a lot of the companies and the inventors and the patent holders on uh, these kinds of shrouds appear to be somewhat disingenuous, shall we say? Like, um, they'll be talking about on their, you know, on their websites about how, like, uh, this will help you exceed the bets limit. You'll be able to get more efficiency from your turbine. Your turbine can actually capture a greater fraction of power than the bets limit allows. Remember, bets limit from way back in module one, uh, one of the course. Well, that's not physically possible. 
Um, I get what they're trying to say. They're trying to say that you, you know, you're getting more power than you would if you had your original rotor because now you're getting it from this larger area, but that's not changing the fact that that's not violating the Betz limit. You're still catching the same fraction of power out on the, on the rotor. Uh, so it doesn't help that there's a little bit of shenanigans, a little bit of foolishness going on in that, uh, you know, among the patent holders and so on. And so we're going to kind of steer clear of that as not being necessarily the best thing to be learning about in an academic environment. Okay. But I wanted you to at least know that term and know what they're thinking about here and what some of the problems associated with this kind of augmented uh, hot te technology. All right. Turning to then the last part of this lecture about the um, <laughs> about uh, wind turbines and so on, I want to talk about some of the kind of more environmental um, considerations we have to take into account when we are designing a wind turbine and deploying a wind turbine and operating a wind turbine and so on. And certainly a very important such consideration is noise. Um, there are important sources of noise associated with the wind operation of a wind turbine. There is mechanical noise that is d due to the parts associated, you know, the, the mechanics of the turbine. And there's aerodynamic noise associated with um, the airflow across the blades and so on. And we'll spend a few moments on each of these things. Now, mechanical noise, again, sometimes there's just no better way to say it than what I found it in the original sources. Um, here it says mechanical noise, that is like mechanical components moving or knocking against each other, may originate in the gearbox, in the drivetrain, the shafts, and in the generator of a wind turbine. These are some potentially very loud, these are loud pieces, these are fast moving pieces of equipment that are very large. Um, I mean, I don't know how much experience you have with noisy equipment. I grew up on a farm and, you know, we had things like you know, mills that ground grain, not like windmills or water mills or something, they were tractor powered, but the, the mill itself generates enormous amounts of noise as it grinds up. I mean, there's just inherently noise involved in like the grinding process. Um, the, the drive trains on different pieces of equipment, um, the only example that comes to my mind is a manure spreader. Uh, when you drive a manure spreader to spread manure on the field, I mean, there's not a lot of moving parts, and yet they hit each other, they make noise, the chains, the drive shaft, there's a, PT, a power takeoff shaft, there's the, yeah, it all just makes noise. Okay, well now you're talking about a piece of equipment that has, you know, shafts rotating at 1800 RPM in a big old gearbox, not to mention the running of operations of a generator up there all of which is just noisy. I mean, there's spinning parts and parts that are hitting each other and so on, all of which has the potential to produce an enormous amount of noise. And at one time, this was actually a major consideration about, and, uh, about how we could build and deploy wind turbines. Um, you know, even growing up on a farm, though just ordinary farm windmill that we had to pump the water, it made a noise as it ran. It was kind of a pumping, squeaking sound as it lifted that shaft up and down to pump water. It was not an entirely unpleasant noise. On the other hand, you hear it all the time. And that does not have these enormous, you know, gearboxes and so on associated with it and so on, spinning at very high speeds. But the truth of the matter is, over time, engineering has largely addressed these problems. Through better engineering, better lubrication, um, soundproofing, etc., most of these kinds of problems about the mechanical noises associated with um, generation of electricity from wind power have largely been addressed. And some of the solutions are remarkably complex. I mean, I really wanted to talk more about them, and the more I looked into it, the more I realized, boy, some of those solutions are really complex. They have to do with um, like changes in the type of steel that they use on the inner parts of the gearbox versus the outer part. Oh my goodness, I, who, who can keep track of all that? It's engineering. This isn't an engineering course, it's engineering. They can address the mechanical noises in much the same way they can address the noises made by a car's engine or something like that. On the other hand, there's also this whole business of aerodynamic noise. Aerodynamic noises are the noises made by the blades as they move through the air. And let's make no mistake about it, those uh, blades are really ripping through the air. The tips of the blades in particular are often moving well in excess of 100 miles per hour. Obviously, it depends very critically on the radius of the blades and their pitch 
and uh, the speed of the wind and so on, but, you know, the figures of 100 to 200 miles per hour at the tip of the blade uh, when you, you know, are certainly not unreasonable at all. So this, you know, large metal blade, I mean, it might be, you know, you know, how, however that long they could be, 70-some meters or whatever, uh, swinging through the wind at, you know, where at the tip of the blade it might be doing 150, 200 miles per hour, it's going to be producing a lot of noise. And I found this little recording. Now, on this recording that you're going to be hearing here, um, it's a little hard to sort out how much of that is noise of, like, the wind on the microphone itself. Uh, my guess is that they tried to address that, you know, by putting foam or something over the microphone. But you know how it is. You go outside with them, like, talk on your cell phone on outdoors. The wind on the microphone makes noise, too. But I think these are mostly the sounds of the turbine itself. It's not exactly the most unpleasant sound, but you wouldn't want to be hearing it all the time either. Um, it, it certainly is a fair amount of noise. Again, I found a wide range of estimates as to how loud this really is. Um, this definitely seems to be an issue of some controversy in the wind power industry. Obviously, the wind power industry wants to tell the world that the, their windmills are not that loud, and you don't need to worry about these noise issues, and besides, we build our windmills fairly far away from populated areas, and so on. On the other hand, there's going to be always be, like, you know, environmental groups and other kinds of NGOs and so on who are going to be saying this is too loud. And so I found such a wide range of estimates of what the actual volume of the sound is. I didn't find that to be a helpful thing to actually give you numbers about. Um, but there's no doubt about it. There is sound involved. Okay, Whether it is a loud enough sound to be problematic depends on your point of view and your interests and so on. Um, but no doubt about it, everybody would prefer if they made less noise. And the sound of this aerodynamic noise can be reduced through careful design of the blade itself. In particular, the tip of the blade. Um, the materials, the extent to which it flexes, there can be active ways in which they can actually kind of like have a, you know, a wingtip kind of design that flips, that can adjust the flow over there. Um, there's no doubt about it. There are ways that we can identify that engineers can produce to make the, 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 the blade make less noise. And obviously finding the right balance between reducing noise but still maintaining the efficiency of the turbine is important. But it is also the case that in general, these turbines are placed far enough back from other structures like neighborhoods and so on. They're generally in a more rural location in part because for safety reasons, in part for noise reasons, in part for shadow flicker reasons, which we're going to be hearing about in just a little bit. Um that we really don't necessarily need to worry that much about aerodynamic noise from a human perspective. A wildlife perspective. That gets a lot more complicated fast. In general, the world's environment is way too noisy for animals. Okay, trains, airplanes, wind turbines, the winds whistling through power lines, urban environments, it's all this road noise from, from highways. It's all way too uh, loud for uh, animals. Um, boats on a lake, it's all just way too loud. Okay, the effects of things like wind turbines on the migration patterns of deer or on the, you know, or whatever, or the, the mating of these grouse or something like that is something actively studied because that is something we don't want to screw up. That being said, there are trade-offs in any decision you make, and renewable clean power versus burning coal, which is also noisy and ruining the planet by greenhouse gas emission, I mean, you kind of have to make trade-offs here. And so if we can find ways to reduce noise or be careful about where we place uh, wind turbines so that we're not affecting the migration of birds or something like that can be an important consideration. Um, Notice, by the way, I have deliberately steered clear in this whole course, and especially in this lecture about turbines, 
of environmental impacts of turbines in general. Obviously, you know that there are environmental impacts associated with things like you hear about, you know, the turbines kill bats or they kill migrating condors or something like that. All of which is a very serious consideration as well and which is kind of beyond the scope of a class about weather and meteorology and turbines, okay? Um, I will leave it to other courses to teach you about whether it's a good idea in the context of like, should we be worried about, you know, bats and condors and things like that. I think we should, but I'm not sure how. Now, one other environmental consideration in terms of like the human environment that we need to be worried about with regard to wind turbines is shadow flicker. Sometimes that's called strobe effects. Sometimes that yeah, goes by this term of shower, shower, uh, shadow flicker. But you know what I'm talking about here. This idea that as the blades of the rotor are turning, they are casting a potentially very large shadow on the ground that has a repeating pattern to it, which can be at the very least extremely annoying and can in fact be detrimental to health. In particular, uh, individuals who are prone to seizures and so on can be affected by this strobe effect as they move in and out of shadows and so on. Um, and because it's very regular as the blades are turning, then you get this sort of pulse of light going on here. Is this an actual problem? Well, yes. If you are in the shadow of a wind turbine, it is, an, at the, again, at the very least annoying and distracting and potentially harmful to your health. There are certainly are anecdotal evidence Pieces, anecdotal pieces of evidence that people have had seizures and so on uh, when being exposed to the strobe effect from the shadow of these turbines here. Uh, but that being said, it's actually not as easy to get into this problem as you might think because of the noise setbacks. Setbacks being like, um, it's a real estate term, where the, um, you know, you have to, structures are built a certain distance away from the turbine, or perhaps another way to put it is uh, the turbines are going to be built more than a certain way from existing structures and no more structures will be built, built near there. It's a term of art in, in uh, real estate, but because of the noise setbacks in the real estate agreements and so on, in general, because of noise if nothing else, turbines are generally placed pretty far from residences, buildings, you know, workplaces, etc. Even like roads and parks and so on typically are not going to be like right there in the shadow of a turbine. Especially considering, you know, at, at mid-latitudes anyway, or tropical latitudes, through most of the day, the, sh the sun is going to be high enough up in the sky that we aren't really going to be experiencing a very long shadow to these turbines. I mean, if the sun's 45 degrees up in the sky, we're going to see a shadow the same height as the turbine itself. So, you know, there'll be a shadow on the order of 100 to maybe 200 meters down. Well, you're probably not even off the grounds of the wind farm yet. Okay, so in general, the sun is high enough in the sky that this doesn't become a problem through most of the daylight hours. And of course, it's in general not a problem at nighttime hours. Um, but it can be a real problem near sunrise and sunset, where because of the extremely low sun angle, you can cast an extremely long shadow from these turbines. Or the, you could, the way to think about it is the strobe effect as the blades pass between your eye and the sun um, can be, you know, projected kilometers down, uh, down, you know, the shadow, down the light of sight. So this can be a very serious problem. This can be where the problem is. And in general, there are, uh, jurisdictions will have rules about things like that. Generally speaking, there will be some requirement that the turbines have to stop when the sun angle is in a certain range. Uh, it's part of what the control systems inside of the wind turbines in a cell are going to be doing is they'll know the software will be able to compute the sun angles and realize, okay, the shadows are now long enough that these um, are the shadow of the moving turbine now is far enough down that it's crossing over that road, for example. Okay, um, the shadow flicker associated with a turbine is a significant distraction to drivers. Therefore, it, they have to stop the turbine while the flicker would be on the road. Okay, the software has already modeled all of this. It has the right geographic information systems in board. It knows it has to stop now, okay, until the sun is now low enough in the sky, there's no more shadow flicker, and it can start back up again. And it'll just adjust the pitch of the blades to stop the turbine for a while. 
And, you know, the sun angles change so fast when the, when the sun, well, the angles change at a fixed rate, but the length of the shadows change so fast near sunset, this might only be a matter of minutes or whatever, but it certainly is an issue. Um, they do have to stop the turbines when the shadow is falling across things like roads, for example. Um, you know, particularly like in that first few minutes after sunrise and the first few minutes before sunset. I'm sorry, those last few minutes before sunset. Those would be legitimate issues that, again, jurisdictions in general will have rules about. Um, but again, that's not a very large fraction of the day where that kind of thing becomes a major problem. All right. Again, those are all just kind of human environment issues associated with wind turbines. I really don't want this to become a um, migrating butterflies kind of issue and things like that. Um, that, that's a complicated set of considerations that aren't about meteorology and climate. All right, now, as we finish up this very long lecture about turbines, which I realize you probably didn't do in one big sitting, I know I wouldn't be able to do it in one big sitting, let's do two more quick questions about wind turbines. Question 13, the greatest source of noise associated with the operation of a wind turbine is A, mechanical noise, B, aerodynamic noise, or C or D, two interesting, oh, this is a trick question kind of options. C, these two sources produce about the same amount of noise, or D, both of these sources of noise have been more or less eliminated by modern engineering. Oh, well, make a choice for those four options and get a little feedback before you move on to the last question in this lecture.